A few years ago, when um, I went to Africa for the first time, after our seventh uh, day, we, had, we were there for seven days, it was a wonderful experience, amazing experience. But my body was not ready for the food that we were eating there. And though food was very simple, you know, typical rice and chicken and stuff. So it was, it was wonderful food, everything was fine. They had a restaurant there and we went there. And the last day, when I was eating a sandwich, I had a gut feeling that something is not all there with the sandwich. And then when I bit that sandwich, it confirmed with my teeth and with my taste buds that this might not be a good idea. But when you pay 20 bucks for a sandwich and you're in Africa, you're like, you know what, who cares? Everything is going to be wonderful. And so, and I swallowed that sandwich to my own disappointment and to the next two weeks of hell on earth. Because I visited bathroom after that more times than I can count. I prayed prayers, any prayers you can think of sitting on that toilet. Asking God to save me, I'll never sin again. And the worst part happened is when I, I got a bacteria and I could not sleep at night. I started to have fevers and I, started, I got really, really sick. And so a few days before flying from this trip in Africa, actually in this particular place we were in, they had a little hospital there. So, I mean, I had a really bad diarrhea and I, had, I was just very sick. So I came to that little hospital there and I asked them for some, some help, some medication to help the brother out. And, um, and they gave me some medication. The lady who was there, she had these very thick glasses. And when I looked at her glasses, I was like, there is no way this lady can see what she's giving me. And so she, and she did it very simply. She came to one bottle, she shook it like this. Mm, no. Came to this one. I'm sitting, I'm horrified. I'm like, if this won't kill me, definitely this medicine will. And I'm just going to die. And so she gives me these big pills. And I'm like, you can kill person how big these pills are. I swallowed these pills, but there was no help. And then uh, one of the things that I always do anytime I have an upset stomach is I would drink a little bit of wine. So I remember we would go to the airport. Now remember, we are on a church trip. And we can't find a place to get wine in, in the airport. So we found a bar. And here is other people from that church who are walking there. Some actually pastors from South Africa. And I met them and they know that I'm a pastor. And here I am <laughs> drinking in the bar in Africa. And I'm like, this is just not a good picture. I'm like, this is just ruining my reputation, ruining my life. And then that didn't help. And so drinking wine didn't help and if we came home and if you belong to a Russian family, everyone in your family has a solution. <laughs> and they know some relatives in Ukraine who have some ideas on how to cure you. And even if that was never tried, they'll try on you and they'll know whether it works or not. And I remember everyone, including my mom and my wonderful aunts, one by one started to come to the house and giving me their cures. Try this, try that, try that. I could write a book on how not to solve a food poison. And after a few weeks, uh, you know, it was all gone and I'm grateful to God for that. This is the, if somebody talks about food poison, this is the event that will never leave my memory. One out of six people in the United States get food poisoned once a year. It's about 48 million people, somebody said. And actually about 128,000 people get admitted to the hospital because of food poison. And about 3,000 people actually die because of food poison every year in America. And we have huge screening for foods, you know, and I mean there's huge regulations that government sets. But still one of the ways that people can actually ruin their health is by the things they eat. <laughs> If you actually read the history, you will find out that this is an ancient way of killing somebody also by poisoning their food. A lot of kings, emperors, a lot of uh, queens who killed their kings. I was kind of studying a little bit and I've read, there's a whole list. I wanted to bring you the names, but they were so long, it wouldn't fit into the screen of how many people were killed by food poison. When something was thrown into their food, they ate and they died. Now most of us, we've seen it in the films when somebody would throw a little pill in somebody's glass and they died. But we know that this is a method that people use sometimes to kill other people. Which is not, you know, a good thing to do, but it sure, it happens. And the enemy also has his tactic 
and one of the ways that he uses many times to kill people not always he comes and just punches a person or gives them you know some kind of a sickness some kind of a mental breakdown sometimes the way he will destroy a person is by poisoning their food the first incident that happened in the Bible was in the garden with our parents Adam and Eve and when the devil came to them he didn't give them a sickness he didn't break the relationship he didn't hit them you know some people think if you know Satan comes to my house he's gonna you know swing his fists at me and I'm gonna you know, look for some kind of a knife to defend myself or a gun he didn't do none of that stuff what he did is he threw a little poison in their food he poisoned them with the things they ate and when he poisoned their food he poisoned their mind and when he poisoned their mind he poisoned their life and when he poisoned their life he poisoned their environment when he poisoned their environment everything else is the result food poison is how the enemy started and many times it's still his best choice the reason why is because with food poison it is your choice to take it or leave it when he attacks sometimes you can't fight back when he gives you food or throws something in the food that you have already he can succeed in the garden we learn a few things if you're taking notes you can write this down there are three voices in life in the garden of Eden we saw three voices the voice of God which was the voice that created everything and this was the voice that spoke life there was also the voice of a serpent the voice of the devil in the garden we saw that voice he questioned God he doubted God's word and he deceived Adam and Eve actually Eve and Adam and Eve uh, gave the fruit to Adam and then the last voice is the voice of people now it's also very important to understand if you can go to the next slide what makes you successful is not the voices you hear but the voices you heed what makes you successful is not the voices you hear it's the voices you act upon we all hear voices and if you're one of those people who sometimes hears you know really weird thoughts into your head it's not because you're strange it's because you're human and as a human you're going to hear voices constantly all the time all kinds of voices all kinds of thoughts what makes you a successful person is not when you only hear good voices it's when you act on good voices what makes you a sinful person is not when you hear a bad voice it's when you act on a bad voice sometimes the, the lie of the enemy is this is when you have a bad thought that came into your head you quickly feel like you have committed a sin but it's not even Jesus had a bad thoughts come to him when he was in the wilderness because when Satan spoke to Jesus we all immediately think that Satan came in a visible form to Jesus in the wilderness and he just you know with the horns says hey I am Satan you know we see in these movies but most likely that's not how he was tempted because the Bible says he was tempted just like you does Satan come to you in a physical form no he was tempted the same way you get tempted thoughts Satan sends thoughts and when a bad thought comes to you you immediately feel bad and the lie of the enemy is this because you have a bad thought that means you've done something bad no you're not bad because a voice of the devil came to you you are bad when you act on that voice someone says you can't stop the birds from flying over your head but you can stop them from building a nest on the top of your head and that's exactly what this means to be a successful person you must understand you cannot just be a person who hears the voice of God you have to be a person who acts on the voice of God to be a bad person you're not just the person who hears bad voices you're the person who acts on them let's, let's uh, write something else down it is as dangerous to hear the voice of man as it is to heed the voice of serpent if it contradicts the voice of God a very interesting part here is this is that God came to Eve and said Eve why did you listen to the voice of a serpent she's like yeah he deceived me he lied to me and blah 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 he goes to Adam and you know what God asked Adam why did you listen to the voice of Eve 
It's as though Satan didn't speak to Adam. Eve did the job. Sometimes it's as dangerous to hear the voice of people if their voice contradicts the voice of God. It is very important to be careful the kind of voices you let into your life even if they are close people. I mean Eve and Adam they were spouse, husband and wife. These were family. Close people. You will have also people in your family sometimes come to you and tell you things that are not from God. Tell you things like you shouldn't go to that church. You're worthless. Everything you try always fails. I wish you wouldn't be born. You never make anything out of your life. Look at your cousin. Look at your sister. Look at her. Look at him. And when you hear these voices, it's actually devil speaking to you. Now this is not a time to take the anointing water, come against your mom or your dad. Fire! Fire! No. But Jesus did that with Peter. When Peter was speaking to him, he was a close associate and Jesus recognized this is not just Peter speaking to me. It's the devil speaking to me through Peter. And Jesus turned around to Peter and said, Peter, you're a rock. But you got it wrong today. You're not on the same page with God today. Be very careful. Because the devil doesn't always speak to your thoughts. Sometimes he speaks through your people. The people you love the most. Because when he will speak to somebody on the news media, what would you do? Mute. Somebody, you know, on the street, you know, flips you off. I remember once I was, I was driving a car and I just could not see this person. And I caught this person off on accident. I thought this car was so far away. And this lady got behind my bumper, turned her high beams on and was honking. So I went on the exit. She followed me all the way to Richland, all the way to Winko, drove around the parking lot. She wasted 25 minutes and I was just circling there because I was going for groceries and I'm like poor lady leave me alone and so when I parked she cussed me out you know and, and I was like lady you got a problem what is your problem I accidentally cut you off that's not my mistake what do you want me to do kiss your car I mean what do you want me to do there's nothing so I'm gonna call cops on you I'm like if you would have you would have done a long time ago just go have a wonderful day forgive this poor sinner of mine see people like that they don't affect you didn't that didn't scar me for life I forgot five minutes into had my little coffee and I forgot completely about that incident but when it's in somebody that close to you it takes five words and it could ruin the rest of your life when somebody says something and that could be the devil speaking you have to be very careful but she's my mom she also can be a devil's agent but she's my wife Adam said at that time she was used by the enemy but they're my precious kids who happen to be a little bit demonized <laughs> but they're my precious people you know they, they can't do anything they mean good for me they do and they're wonderful people don't get me wrong but you have to understand that sometimes the enemy will get to you through the people who are the closest because those people you are undisarmed with them you don't have any armor to protect yourself from them you're very vulnerable anything you say it comes like a glue and Satan says, Satan sees when he sends a bad thought to you you will quickly repel it but if they send something to you you will quickly receive it that's why you have to be careful I'm not saying to build a wall against everyone what I'm saying is that when you are in a situation like Jesus where Peter his closest disciple says Jesus you shouldn't go to the cross think about your political career you're trying to be a king hanging naked on the cross is not gonna help to think about the publicity you're gonna get from that it's not something you want Jesus it's common sense you would think and then Jesus looks at Peter and he says get behind me Satan meaning this wasn't just Peter's idea it's as dangerous to hear people's voice as it is to heed the devil's voice if it contradicts the voice of God just because she's your, he's your father or he, she's your mother, your child, your wife, your best friend. But if they make fun of you, crash you, hurt you with their words, literally just belittle you and embarrass you. It's the devil speaking through them. And they yielded to him in the moment of their weakness. 
and therefore you reject those words in your mind as you would reject words sent straight from hell you say no i reject that that's not for me i am not accepting this in jesus name i love the person who's sending those words i destroy those words over my life and over my future can someone say amen another thought that I want us to write down food poison treatment so we, we've learned that there's three kind of voices and that it's not the voice you hear it's the voice you act upon we also learned today that sometimes it's as dangerous to hear the voice of people as it is to hear the voice of the devil if it contradicts the voice of God but I want us today to look at this story if you have your Bible let's go to Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3 Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3 and the Lord said my spirit shall not strive with man forever for he is indeed flesh and his days shall be 120 years and let's go to Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 and the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and every intent of his thoughts of his heart was only continually evil I want you in your Bible to underline word every I want you to underline only and continually every only and continually this is very interesting because this shows to us see we all have thoughts in our mind that are evil we all have thoughts in our mind that are negative we all have thoughts in our mind that are depressing we kind of you know you're not good at this you're not good you're you're a sinner we all have thoughts like that we all do but the problem happened when every thought only and continually the thoughts that dominate your life are the dominant thoughts in your mind we all have negative thoughts but when the negative thoughts become dominant when they begin to be every only and continually that is when great wickedness begins to happen in life every only continually when a person has a thought that you have in your mind that is every only and continually that thought produces a great of every only and continually see they had inside of them thoughts of evil every only and continually and then God came and he saw no longer inside of them he saw great wickedness around them if you have in your mind every only and continually thoughts of success it's a matter of time God himself will see great success even around you this works for you and this works against you if you only see every only and continually thoughts of defeat thoughts that you're not good enough thoughts that you will never make it it's a matter of time and it will be said about you and it will be said about me great of whatever we think every only and continually is around us Can someone say amen if we can go to the verse 3 again my spirit will not strive with men forever it's interesting that God's spirit could not put up with men's negativity forever write this down Holy Spirit does not put up with poison mind forever that doesn't mean Holy Spirit will not love people with poisoned minds. It doesn't mean the Holy Spirit will leave people with poisoned minds. It's that He will not put up forever. It's, it's also in the verse 3 we see God doesn't say I will remove my spirit. I always when I read this a little bit before and I this weekend I was kind of rereading it and restudying this verse and I always thought God says I'm removing my spirit you're all gonna die but it doesn't say that here God says my spirit 
since none of you guys are dying he's troubled with how poisoned you are on inside so this is what I'm going to do I'm not going to remove my spirit I'm gonna end your life faster so he doesn't have to put up with you this is his earth he made it this is his home you're not gonna stay here forever because you staying here forever makes it very hard for him to stay here and he's not leaving you're leaving this tells us people with poisoned mind will live short lives people with poisoned minds cannot have a lasting relationship with Holy Spirit why because the Holy Spirit is invisible so are your thoughts the Holy Spirit is invisible so are your motives the Holy Spirit is invisible so are your emotions that means when you are on inside negative full of defeat full of I can't do full of nothing ever works out for me full of shame guilt and fear full of evil full of lust and full of pride full of bitterness hate and negative emotions the Holy Spirit looks at that right in his face the way I see your face you see mine and I cannot see your thoughts now I know you're thinking something you must be thinking something but I can't see that and that does, doesn't really concern me I just want to make sure you know you're not like mad at me you know make sure you, your face is like showing that hey you you're cool with me and stuff and most of you here are and uh, and that's completely good but the Holy Spirit he doesn't have a physical face so guess what he sees the way I see your face and you see mine guess what he sees like that your thoughts the very area the very part of us we always put under the carpet because we're like nobody else sees it I'm not smoking I'm not drinking I'm not doing anything bad so come on but our thoughts many times are racing and raging negative full of shame full of this and full of this and that's what the Holy Spirit sees right in his face and God says he's been seeing this for so long they cannot live here forever because Holy Spirit is getting really tired of this so he says we're gonna cut their ears I'm not gonna kill them remove them I'm just gonna make their lives a little bit shorter make it easier for the Holy Spirit if you want to have a lasting relationship with the Holy Spirit please understand it has very little to do very little to do with how many saints you have in your house hanging on the walls it has very little to do whether you smoke or not smoking is not good for you if God would want you to smoke he will build a chimney on the top of your head it's not good that's common sense that's like jumping from a second floor head down I mean come on that, that's that's not good but that's not really the main concern many people think if I want to have a deep and close relationship with the Holy Spirit I have to live my life or you know I don't have earrings I don't have makeup and I look like you know I'm 16 but I look like I'm 60 and stuff and I walk around depressed and sad and then Holy Spirit will look at how miserable I am and he will say you are worthy to be in a relationship with me because you're miserable that is not really Holy Spirit stays with those whose minds are not poisoned whose minds are not poisoned uh, my, my wife shared a story of of one person whom she knows very close who currently doesn't go to church and who um, doesn't even live a um, a godly lifestyle according to the the tradition and according to the Bible but this person started to listen to the teachings about fourth dimension about how important it is to talk to Holy Spirit with positive images and this person made a decision that if God will give me a job I will start giving him 10 percent and then miraculously that prayer was answered this person went to her job and saw a particular job that she wanted her dad to have in her job and she started to pray to the Holy Spirit so Holy Spirit please answer me and please help me and within last week her dad got that job and she says now I'm praying for my husband he's like we need to get married and we'll, we will come back to church and I'm thinking Holy Spirit does not work with people like that he does our life is not as important as our thoughts I've seen people who live right only on the outside if you cut them open on the inside it's a pure junkyard I'm not indicating you know a sinful lifestyle or anything of that but I'm saying if you think that on the outside you got a good haircut you shaved and you parked correctly you paid your taxes that somehow you're a candidate to work with the Holy Spirit that is not true your thoughts have to be open to him 
your thoughts have to be clean before him meaning they have to be full of positivity you have to full of can do full of God is for me full of positivity not poison and then Holy Spirit finds pleasure in working with us can someone say amen number two great wickedness is a result of dominating thoughts that occupy your mind you can change word wickedness for great success anything great in your life comes as a result of dominating thoughts that occupy your mind great wickedness is a result of dominating thoughts that occupy your mind we see this happen with the ancestors of Adam and Eve Adam and Eve had everything going for them but their mind was being polluted and poisoned by the lies of the devil they still had everything going for them the next chapter which is chapter 4 of Genesis we see the first murder in chapter 5 and chapter 6 we see not only murders we see such an immorality and such a violence and such a crime on this little young earth so bad that God said this is this is unbelievable he said these people will kill themselves these people will end everything this, this is ridiculous how fast and rapid it took just few generations and everything just went so bad because great wickedness is the result of the dominating thoughts that dominate your mind you will always have thoughts that are visiting your mind like they come in and they leave you will have thoughts on the vacation in your mind when you're Christmas time you're so focused on this and that but the dominating thoughts are the thoughts that have a lease month to month and they stay there all the time those are the thoughts will determine outcome of your life you can have a diploma you can finish the greatest school in the United States you can be very beautiful you can be very handsome and you can be very outgoing and a people person you can have good connections if the dominating thoughts in your mind are negative your life will be negative if the dominating thoughts in your mind are full of defeat your life will be full of defeat period great wickedness comes as a result of the dominating thoughts that dominate our mind write down point number three paradise can be ruined by food poisoning paradise can be ruined by food poisoning paradise that Adam and Eve was in it was a perfect environment it was an environment that lacked nothing this tells us that it's possible to have your thoughts on a different level than your environment think about it everything is good in the garden and nothing is good in their mind if that is true then also the other side can be true when nothing is good in your life everything can be good in your mind if everything is amazing beautiful nothing is wrong in the garden everything is wonderful but when people have a wrong mindset shame and fear and husband and wife they begin to hide from God and fight and blame themselves blame each other and blame God and all of that inner chaos inside but they're living in a paradise and within a very short time we see they lose paradise because life lines up to the level of our mind there will be areas and times in our lives where everything will be fine and you would think when everything is fine I will think good some people excuse their negative thinking saying my life is very difficult once it gets better I find a husband I find a rent I fix that stupid car that has 25,000 demons in it in the engine and once I clean everything up I get rid of my debt and once I start and move into New York or I move into Seattle only then my life will get better what you're saying is this if I find a paradise good mind will find me newsflash Adam and Eve had paradise and had nothing good here and they lost the paradise don't lie to yourself don't think if you lose weight you're gonna walk around feeling confident no walk around feeling confident and you will lose weight 
don't walk around and say if I find someone to love me and only then you know I will just go ahead and start coming to church I will go ahead and start feeling confident I'm not gonna sell myself to cheap no stop selling yourself to cheap start feeling confident and you will find someone who will not be a crutch to you but who will be a blessing to you because nothing is wrong nothing is worse in relationships when a person walks in who is needy instead of having something to offer relationships don't last when there is a problem with both people and both people come and they're saying I need you and you need me and I need you and I need you those relationships are doomed to fail even if you make six digit incomes even if you look like great and you have everything if you have that kind of attitude it will not last and the first thing that must happen is this don't wait for a paradise invite a paradise in your mind change your mind change your feelings choose to think like God says to think to feel like God says to feel and the paradise will come if you find a paradise but your mind is a mess it will happen like to our forefathers they lost the paradise because their mind was poison Satan will destroy our world by destroying our mind and he destroys our mind by destroying our food the way he poisons our world is by poisoning our mind and the way he poisons our mind is by poisoning our food how did he poison the food of Adam and Eve I'm gonna bring to you two main ingredients of every poison that the enemy will bring into our life the first one is he distorts the view of God's goodness and the second one he twists the view of God's word he messes up the view of God's goodness and secondly he twists the word of God how did Satan succeed with Adam and Eve when he came to them and said has God truly said not to eat of this tree it's interesting that Satan always starts with putting a question mark where God put an exclamation mark this is how he twists the word of God he will always put a question where God says period by his stripes we are healed but the enemy will come and says is it really true and there's nothing wrong with putting a question mark but after the question mark Satan adds and he says it shall not be so he said you will not die and he adds his lie Satan will always doubt what God said clearly and bluntly he said God knows a secret if you eat of that tree you become like gods you will know good and evil you will be something special you will know something some secret only he does he knows and you don't know he is holding something back from you when he asks you not to touch that it's not because he really cares for you come on you're not stupid aren't you God does not want you to have something he is not that good that you think if the enemy can crack in your head that God is not good he disarmed you you will be vulnerable to protect yourself to realize nobody is really for me if I don't get it nobody will give it to me if I don't find it nobody will find it for me that God he is hiding something good from me I gotta go find it on my own even if that means compromising my conscience even if that means compromising my faith whatever I have to do why because I am my own boss if I don't do it for myself nobody is going to do it for me Satan will convince you that God is good sometimes most people are convinced of this oh on the outside we say God is good all the time but if we cut our thoughts open and put them on a scanner and you will see this this vein running through our thoughts God is good sometimes our Bible says all the time and all the time God is good do you know why you believe God is good sometimes God didn't say people will be good all the time God didn't say you will be good all the time 
and God didn't say your circumstances will be good all the time he says he will be good all the time God didn't say the government's gonna be good all the time God did not say that your boss is going to be good all the time. God didn't say your family is going to be good all the time. And he didn't even indicate that your health will be good all the time. He said, I will be good all the time. No mood swings, no shadow of changing. That means God is always good. To overcome the lie of the enemy, you have to deeply receive this, that he is not good sometimes. He is not good only when you get a breakthrough. He is also good when things are challenging. He does not change. The enemy convinced the first parents God is holding something good from you. And if you're gonna take this, you will experience something so incredible. And then he uses the very words, the second thing that we said is that he twists the word of God. He takes the words that God spoke and he twists them. He said that's not really what, what, what this means and he actually uses that against them and they eat of the fruit and they don't discover the truth about being gods. They discover the truth about being naked and ashamed and lied to and deceived. I found out sometimes in a Christian life is that the enemy sometimes will use God's word against you. He will take a scripture out of context from the Old Testament to scare the living lights out of you. You'll read the scripture about Ananias and Sapphira died bringing an offering after they sold the whole house and gave only 50% of their income instead of all of it. You bring your offering and instead of saying God bless me you say God don't kill me. I remember a person got saved a few months ago comes to me and we encouraged him we said hey Jesus forgave all of your sin God loves you and everything he comes on Wednesday so excited and he grabbed my hand I thought he's gonna jerk my shoulder out of my socket grabbed my hand he says I read in first John it says if he who commits one sin commits all the sins and if you say you're sinless you're lying he said it's over and I'm like what do you mean he said I'm going to hell because if I say I'm not a sinner, God says I'm lying, I'm already sinning and if I am sinning that means I'm going to hell. He says and you told me I am not going to hell and I'm righteous. I was like bro a few more thoughts from you and I'm gonna go with you there. You're confusing me and I'm standing there and I was like my goodness what do I do? And he throw, keeps throwing scriptures at me and I was like bro relax. And I'm saying I was the like, Holy Spirit help me <laughs> to help this guy because I am losing it myself right now and as I am standing there with him and I'm realizing that the enemy uses the word that like a sword that's supposed to defeat him he turns that sword so it defeats us and I asked that man I said do you have daughters he said yes I do I said what do they have to do to stop being your daughters he said where does that say in the Bible I said answer my question what do they have to do to stop being your daughters? I said nothing. I said do you love them? He said yes. If they make a mistake will that grieve you? Oh yeah. Why will that grieve you? Because I love them. Will you kick them out of the house? No. But if they leave out of the house I can't drag them. I said here you have an answer. You just answered your own question. You have to see the Bible through the lenses that God is for you and he's your father. That's what I told him. He said, what about those scriptures? Look at those scriptures through the lens I just gave you. Or else the enemy will take the word of God, confuse you, throw you into doubt and bring you into fear. You said, that's not possible. The enemy cannot do that with the word of God. He did it with our parents and he did it with Jesus in the wilderness and he will do it with you. He will use the word of God against you. Pull scriptures out of, out of a context and to bring you into a place of fear, doubt and condemnation. God's word, first time God spoke in Genesis, it's to give light, not darkness. The Bible says God's word is a seed. Bible says God's word is bread. Bible says God's word is light. The Bible says God's word is lamb. God's word is a hammer that breaks the grip of the enemy. God's word is not to bring fear. God's word is not to bring confusion. God's word is to bring conviction but not condemnation. And anytime you read this book and you feel fear and condemnation, it's because you're now reading it with the Holy Spirit. You're reading it with some other thing. 
you can't just believe that just because this is the book and that's it if in this book God is without the Holy Spirit this book can be used against you by the enemy therefore the decision you have to make is this I will read the Bible it's good to read it in Greek it's good to read the Bible in Latin it's good to read the Bible in English it's good to read the Bible in Spanish and in Russian but the best thing to do is to read the Bible in the Holy Spirit he will help us to feel the love of God the grace of God can someone say amen we're going to finish this message on the fourth point you can write this down fig leaves will not remove poison fig leaves will not remove poison when Adam and Eve ate the food poison they did what everyone would do when they get food poison they tried to look for a cure they didn't go to God for a cure because God is holy and God does not have in his cabinet any cure for sin because there is no sin in heaven they thought there is no God never had any experience with that you know sometimes when I have a little problem or if you have a little problem you call your parents you say mom and dad did you ever have a same problem you know if you're a young lady and uh, you're pregnant you know you ask your mom you ask somebody who had the same uh, delivery I mean Mariana you know she's pregnant she's gonna be uh, delivering soon she's not gonna come to me and say Vlad you know any tips on delivery it's foolish yeah and she's not gonna ask Ilya for tips he has experience but with a lot of other things but not with this and sometimes we feel like when we sin it's kind of like coming to God asking for help but he has no experience with sin how can he help me and the first thing we do we don't go to him because going to God when you make a mistake is like going to a police station when you stole a car you just don't there's just few things you don't do and that's one of them and Adam and Eve felt like we can't go to God because he has no experience with sin we've never heard of stories of people disobeying and making it alive satan didn't work well for him that's why he's crawling here and so we are we gotta find a way to fix ourselves and so they find themselves they find these fig leaves but the fig leaves are so thin the fig leaves are so fragile the fig leaves are so so weak that even after they put them on they still felt so ashamed and still felt so scared that the bible says they hid themselves from god no wonder when Jesus came on this earth one of the things Jesus cursed being on this earth is fig fig tree because it's been humanity's self-medication fig leaves for some people fig leaves is a bottle of whiskey for some people fig leaves is time they say if I could only get some just time will heal all my wounds for some people fig leaves is marriage I think the, all the abuse I had in my life that someone will fix it for some people fig leaf is a religion if I can only commit to go to church every week it will make all of my problems go away everyone has fig leaves and it's not as strange when you feel ashamed when you feel in sin when you feel down you always look for your fig leaf for some people it's a movie it helps you to zone out for some people it's working out you get lost and you you feel that pain and you push through you see the results and it keeps you helps you to keep confident every person has their fig leaf and fig leaf is sometimes not a bad thing it just doesn't work it just doesn't work and Adam and Eve had their fig leaves they they put them on and it did not work when God came he found them with fig leaves brought them out he said guys what happened why are you feeling so scared why are you feeling so shy what happened a few days ago you were running around butt naked everything was fine I'm not ashamed of you I don't hate you I don't think you're you're disgusting I made you I love you there's nothing wrong with you what what is oh oh and the first thing God said what did you eat the moment he saw people feeling bad he always asked them what was their diet your feelings are the direct result of your eating did you eat of that thing that I told you not to eat 
and Adam quickly says no it's her and she says no you don't get the point I'm not trying to blame you here we're trying to find the problem so that we can cure it and you're here shifting the blame on one another 21. Genesis 3 21 says the following I'm gonna read it to you right now also for Adam and his wife the Lord made tunics of skin and clothed them One of the things that really has helped me is to know that Adam and Eve when they sinned and committed mistake and they felt like they disappointed God and they disappointed themselves that God had already tunics of skin in the closet so that you don't think I'm bluffing Revelations 3 8 says the following all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names were not written in the book of life of the lamb who was slain from foundations of the world 1 peter 1 20 he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifested in these last times for you you know what this means before God made the foundations of the world he already had Jesus as an option if we fall he will die Adam's mistake didn't catch God out of surprise the code was already in the closet See Adam felt like there was nobody here on this earth and God will not understand and if he will understand he will not know what to do with me because he's never had an experience with sin he never had an experience to do with what I just done and Adam did not know that God in his closet did not have a rifle he had a coat And the Bible says when Adam was leaving God put that coat on him and in the New Testament it tells us before the foundations of the earth Jesus Christ was already slain that means that he was already ready to go see in case these people will sin because they are capable of sinning I will die for them God didn't just make you perfect God made He made a way when you won't be. He made allowance. He didn't expect or anticipate. He didn't make a mistake in our DNA to cause us to sin. He gave us the free choice and He knows with free choice comes a great responsibility and that we could slip and fall. He knew the abilities of us to make mistakes. He knew it's within our reach and He knew that I am going to make a way just in case they do. I will have a coat in the closet and then He looks from heaven and He sees you're looking for a leaf. You need to know God has a coat. God has a coat of tunic you know tunic of skin tunic of skin this is the first time an animal was killed in the Bible it wasn't killed by a human looking for food it was killed by God looking for clothes a lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth this is the time where a lamb was slain probably physically by God not for food of humans but for the clothing of humans see when a cow gives milk the cow does not lose life but when a certain animal gives its fur for your clothing for your garment that animal has to lose its life by giving you something to wear that's exactly what happened with Jesus on the cross he gave you his wear his righteousness so he had to die so you can wear that skin of his God has it in his closet there's a story in the Bible that really resonates that for me it's a story of a father and two sons this father was getting old 
and whether he had a doctor's report that he was dying we don't know but he was nearing his death and he decided to gather both of his sons and divide his money with them his money with them it wasn't their money he was dividing it was his money imagine you working as a hard-working person you have your 401k or you have your Roth IRA whatever you have for your retirement you have a lot of money you got properties you got cars and at the end of your life you're not dead yet but before your death you decide to kind of you know split your inheritance amongst your kids now it's your stuff and he divides his inheritance between his kids because one of the kids came to him and said dad I know you're not dead yet I want your stuff if you could have hurry up to die would have been better but you seem not to die so can I get your stuff before you die what if you don't die imagine an insult you get if one of your kids loves your stuff more than your life your stuff the ones you work so hard for our kids like we have five of us we will never be able to do it to our parents if we come and say mom and dad we know you still got a lot of years on you but that house that you have that car that you have could you split it among us you would see us in jail you're not gonna see me driving my parents car because they will say this is our stuff you go get your own stuff but this dad looks at his literally forgive me stupid son and instead of giving him a slap in the face says you stupid I don't know which track, train tracks you came up, but you're crazy. I'm alive and I'm not giving you my car because you over here decided to have my stuff. You're getting nothing. But this dad gives him. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't be able to do that. God does. Gives us the free choice. Knowing we could turn against him. No, we can give him a middle finger. Knowing we can turn our back and say, I don't want to do nothing with you. And he'll still let the sun come every morning just for you. The very ones who will turn their backs and say, I don't want to do nothing with you, God. Leave me alone. I wish you wouldn't exist. And God says, you wouldn't exist either. But because I'm so good, I still let you exist. Imagine that. The love some people think that God's love is the fact that God let Jesus die on a cross God's love is the fact God let you live imagine how much I mean we committed treason and God still lets us have good days still lets rain come upon upon our crops still lets sun come upon us still lets us have breath and everything and God this father lets his son go away with all of his inheritance though he's hurting him embarrassing him ruining his reputation he still lets him do that and this son the interesting part he wastes all of that money and finds out my dad is still not dead imagine the dilemma it's one thing if you wasted the money and he's dead you could come back and say well he died I wasted his stuff let's start all over but you come back home realizing all of the things he worked through all his life he's not even dead and you wasted that imagine the shame imagine the guilt I wouldn't be able to come back to him but there being there inside of that pig pen wasted everything knowing dad is still alive he says I will go and I'm not gonna ask to be his son I'm not gonna ask for anything because well I wasted all of my portion he said my dad is so good he loved me when I was at my stupid he will accept me to work for him and he makes his way to his dad he knew his dad had a coat hanging in a closet he comes and the Bible says the first words come out of his mouth is dad I am not worthy to be your son and his dad stops him there the reason why he stops him is because you're not worthy you're not a son because of worth you are a son because of your birth he says son no 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 no. you don't become a son by worth and you don't lose being son by worth it has to do with the birth and you are my son he embraces him he brings a coat they, they bring a ring on him and the bible says they throw a party and when the older son was mad and not happy he looked at him and he says my son used to be dead when he had all the money now when he stings like a pig he's alive that is God for you 
when you make a mistake you cannot run from him you have to run to him why because he has a coat hanging in the closet for you how this has to do with poison mind all of the positivity that comes in our mind has to come from the foundation that all of my sin has been dealt with on the cross you cannot think continuously only always victory in your mind if you're not convinced for everything you've done in your past Jesus Christ bled on the cross for you for the weaknesses you have in your present and for the things you might commit in your future all of that already has been covered in the cross does that mean that this gives us a right to sin no I have a car insurance that does not give me a right to have an accident I didn't get a car insurance with Geico so that I can on the first day when I got a car insurance it will cover all my accidents let me just look for accidents in some 10 years of driving I did not have an accident on purpose I'm not gonna lie to you I thought about it a few times but I didn't have an accident on purpose if my insurance covers my accidents how much more the blood of Jesus will cover my mistakes but do you know when you have to get your insurance before the accident see most people only come to Jesus when they make a mistake you have to have Jesus's blood and the assurance no matter how I fall no matter how weak I am in my glove box is the insurance he will restore me he will help me he will never turn his back on me he is for me he loves me he will forgive me and he will beat the devil for me and I will rise up and do great things for God can someone say amen Jesus said eat my flesh and drink my blood meaning I want you to have a new diet of thinking what I've done on the cross thinking of what I did on the Calvary for you let that sink in let that change you not your past not what people have said not what you feel and not what you've done but what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for you can someone say amen guys this is a good day this is a day where we celebrate God's goodness and maybe you're like Adam and Eve today maybe you've not done anything wrong you know that Adam and Eve did not do a crime they didn't kill nothing they didn't kill no one they didn't steal nobody they didn't hit nobody they only had a bad diet it was disobedience to God they felt so ashamed they felt so afraid they felt sense of guilt that they could not remove only God can remove that maybe you've done things here that you feel condemned about maybe you've done things that nobody else knows that you feel very ashamed maybe other people have made you feel below zero because of your past maybe you cannot forgive yourself today and your mind is full of negativity and if you tell me why I'll probably be negative with you it's like the person who was sitting on the, the edge of the cliff deciding to commit suicide and the other person came in and says you know I want to help you not to commit suicide tell me all your problems and when the other person told him all his problems both of them committed suicide maybe if you tell me all your problems I might be as negative as you are but I want to tell you something right now together we can accept the truth that God loves us through Jesus Christ we can receive that forgiveness we can receive that grace we can rise up and do great things for God amen